Money never sleeps, pal. Okay, morning, Gareth. Still the first week of January 2024. Probably about as good a time as any to talk about what happened last year and how things might shape up for 2024. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I saw the, the recent Hypernormal Times article on uh, will October's pivot shape 2024. So there's clearly a huge amount going on. And if you cast your mind back this time last year, the whole world in January 2023 was preparing for a recession. And yeah, it was a matter in, of when, not if, wasn't it? Yeah. And in most economies, and particularly in the US, that didn't materialize. But at the same time, we had high hopes that China was coming out of lockdown later than everybody else, and that we would all be bailed out by the Chinese recovery, which also failed to materialize. I mean, we're still, you know, and China is notably the only major market in the world that is down over the 12 month period. So investors started the year with the wrong expectations. Uh, we were fearing inflation and the consequences of this higher for longer interest rate policy. Interest rates rising was the feature for most of 2023. But I think the most important event in 2023 happened in October or basically in the third quarter where the world pivoted from the expectation of higher for longer to one of higher for not much longer. I, we began to discount or investors began to discount an outlook for lower interest rates. If you look at the way financial markets performed in 2023, it was a very different picture in the first nine months compared with the last three to four months, where the world or the outlook for financial markets moved to one of lower interest rates and began to price in quite dramatically lower interest rates during the course of 2024, which meant that bond yields declined and liquidity improved, financial conditions improved, the dollar weakened, and we had this run on risk assets. And the specific thing that happened is that the injection of liquidity and positive expectations reawakened small cap companies. In the US, the Russell 2000, the, the widely followed small cap index, rose over 20% in the final two months of 2023. I think the first nine months for equity markets of 2023, the main narrative was US big tech and the magnificent seven, the, these AI wonder stocks, um, seven companies that have a collective market value of $12 trillion just took all the oxygen out of equity markets. And they were that was the story of 2023, but it changed. And it changed in this period, probably sometime around the first week of October. There's a lot going on on the sort of the, the political landscape, and and I suppose one of the things which is in a lot of investors' minds is the U.S. presidential election. And it'd be great to hear what what you think. I mean, clearly there is a possibility, or a number of people would say a probability, that Trump could be the next U.S. president. What do you think that would do to financial markets? I mean, either when and if it happens, or, or potentially in the run up to it, as it becomes possibly more and more likely. That, that Trump is going to emerge the winner. Do you think that will spook markets or do you think that that's something that markets will take in their stride? I think the likelihood is that Trump will win, but I think that's a scary thought for a lot of people. But I think in terms of the consequences for, for equities, um, I think it actually could be quite positive. Obviously, we take anything any politician takes with a pinch of salt and Trump, you should do so more so than most. But his, I would argue his, you know, one of the things he's saying is that he can do a deal with Putin. He can finish the conflict in Ukraine. And whatever you think of the politics of that or the likelihood of it happening, if he could make, wave a magic wand and end the conflict in the Ukraine, then clearly that's going to have a positive effect for economic growth. The first mechanism I can think of would be a, a further downward move in oil prices and energy prices. And yeah. Strategically, that is very significant, particularly for Europe. Yeah. And... I think in terms of the UK, we've discussed it previously, but I, I guess there's the steadily increasing view that the UK political landscape's sufficiently similar across the board. There's, there's not a huge amount of, of clear water between the two parties in terms of their impact on, on markets or the, the way that investors broadly would see a Labour government versus a, a Tory government. 
So presumably that means that the UK is relatively low in terms of perceived political risk, especially seeing as some of the other countries have got quite extreme potential outcomes one way or another. And so is, is there a view then that investors might start to revisit the UK in terms of their sort of global asset allocation processes? And would that lead to potentially a, a re-rating of the UK markets over time? You know, the, the way I put it, I think 2023, we got most improved player award in the political stability stakes, you know, given that in 2022, we had three prime ministers in the, in the space of whatever it was, four or five months. I think voters and citizens of the UK, as far as international investors are concerned, whether it's multinational companies looking to build factories or whether it's portfolio investors looking to allocate to our financial markets, a smooth transition of power in the UK between two parties that I would regard or two prime minister candidates who I would regard as both centrist, particularly in when you compare to other elections that have taken place recently or will take place in the coming months. The outcome of the UK election is not consequential in terms of radical change. And I think that will give global investors confidence that the UK is off the naughty step post-Brexit. You know, I think we'll have a general election where our relationship, the UK's relationship with Europe is not the predominant issue. And that is, whatever you think of it, will be seen as a positive as far as global investors are concerned. And that obviously things change, but as things stand at the moment, I think global investors will just say, yep, tick in the box. The UK is coming off this period of being uninvestable in over what is now, you know, an eight year period since Brexit. One, one other thing that global investors have definitely been looking at is you mentioned earlier the, the Magnificent Seven and the extraordinary focus on AI as a technology during 2023. And certainly the, the way that I've seen it evolve is that 2023 was largely about almost the discovery of AI across the market and very early development and early deployments of it. But 2024 could see much broader adoption of AI in many, many areas of the workplace. And I think there's a there's a view that that could lead to increased productivity, which could help reduce inflation. And I'm just wondering whether you think that that's going to be a real feature of 2024. And, and if so, whether there'll be some countries or some areas of the economy which will benefit more strongly or more rapidly than others. I would agree with your view, but caution on the view that the market overestimates the introduction of technology in the short term, but underestimates its impact in the long term. And that's true whether you're talking about the dot-com boom, where you know, the dot-com boom was all about overestimating things in the short term, or, or whether you're talking about the introduction of the railways in the mid-1800s. The market psychology is that we tend to get overexcited about these things. And I would just caution that the valuation of the Magnificent Seven is more like Cisco being the largest company in the world temporarily in the year 2000 or 1999, whenever it was, it didn't last for long. I mean, it's still around today. It's still a very successful business, but it's a shadow of its former self in terms of the valuation the market puts on it. Yeah. I just wonder whether NVIDIA is Cisco and that if AI is this, and I think it might well be a massive increase in human productivity gains and the answer to our requirement or our, the, the answer to the productivity puzzle, particularly if in a world where China is no longer that engine of productivity growth that it was for the last, has been for the last 20 years. You just got to think about what time frame this all plays out. In terms of investment, the investment outcome from the advent of AI we're still very much in, in the early throes of, of understanding who the long-term winners will be and what type of business model we'll be talking about that will really benefit from the investment or from the trend that's happening in front of us. I know you're a big fan of China. 2024 could be the year when China gets the recognition for the technology companies it's produced and developed, which by comparison to the US and other markets, China looks very lowly valued. You know, I don't, I'm not sure I'd put my money there, but as a global investor, the relative valuation of big tech in the US and big tech in China is just extreme at the moment. Mm -hmm. Taking that China theme and cutting back to the, the comments or the questions about the, the broader outlook and in terms of the economies and interest rates and, and whether the recession that we were all expecting, as you said, at the beginning of 2023, whether that's just been delayed 
or whether it's been avoided completely. I suppose it'd be interesting just to get your views on on that issue in particular. And I guess whether there's a risk that a sudden recovery or a resurgence in China could lead to some inflationary pressures that we're not expecting and might change the outlook or the perspectives around whether we can avoid a recession completely and and achieve this soft landing, um, or whether it's going to be a little bit more difficult to manage our way through that than investors might be expecting probably the biggest unanswered question from 2023 is what happened to the recession that we were widely expecting in Q1. And there's been a slowdown, a barely perceptible one in a lot of markets, particularly the US. My view is that we've discounted a lot already. I mean, 2022 was a very bad year for all financial markets and discounted a lot of bad news, which hasn't happened in 2023. We had a bit of a dry run of a financial crisis that didn't happen with the regional banks and Silicon Valley Bank Mm -hmm. back in March last year. The recovery from the lockdown was not a normal business cycle. You know, the, the world economy was turned off and then it was turned back on again. And it was done at different places at different times. So hence the reason why China's in a different cycle, certainly to the US. So we're at a, rather than a sort of evenly rotating business cycle type recession, I think we've had a rolling recession that impacted different countries and different sectors at different times. One of the remarkable events or the remarkable achievements, outcomes of 2023, is that whereas this time last year, we in Europe were waiting to get very cold and run out of natural gas. Uh, we're sitting here 12 months later uh, with an abundant, the world is awash with, with natural gas and liquefied natural gas. Now, Europe's paid a price for that, but the wheels haven't stopped turning. And I think to sort of come back to the question, specific question on China, I think that is, it's unknown, but it is a critical factor, is are we seeing a structural decline in the Chinese economy, or are we just seeing a later cycle recovery? And I think we'll find out in the coming 12 months. And I'm very unclear. I know you're a, more of a bull on China than I've been, but you know, I just can't decide. What I do know is that China is cheap. And that investors have almost given up on China, which means it's interesting. Mm. Yeah, I know. Absolutely. I mean, I'm hopeful for the Chinese economy in itself, but I guess there there is also that the risk that a, a resurging China could significantly increase global demand for not just energy, but a number of other commodities and, and you know goods of all types. Yeah, and and that might be a, an inflationary shock that we haven't been expecting. And I think it's it's easy to paint a, a relatively rosy picture of of inflation steadily more and more under control. Ukraine is at least factored into everyone's models. And and if the potential next president, Trump, can effect some miraculous resolution of of the conflict, even better. And I suppose just as investors look for what what could be the surprises or the shocks of 2024, uh, a suddenly recovering China could be one of those, which in in some ways would be positive, but in other ways might lead to a a few more concerns about the battle between interest rates and inflation, whether we've really got that under control. But as you say, I think we'll we'll learn a lot more as as the year moves on. I mean, so a recovering China will consume a lot more raw materials. The, the history of the last 25 years is that the growth of China has been hugely deflationary for the world because it's meant we've all got cheaper stuff. There is no longer this oversupply. It doesn't seem as though there's this endless supply of cheap labor coming out of China. Things have changed in that regard. So yeah. Chinese growth from here could become more inflationary, I guess. Maybe it would be worth just wrapping up with a, a bit of a view on how the UK sits within this you know, turbulent and, and quite unpredictable global landscape and how you think investors might be looking at the UK markets in particular and whether we could see a, a continuation of the trend, as, as you said earlier, that we, we've started to see of a, something of a, a recovery in the small cap space as, as people potentially are prepared to take more risks in the, the, the smaller stocks, partly because the larger ones are have been quite significantly more highly valued, but, but also perhaps as there is a more of a risk on approach as we go through 2024. Yeah, I think it's very positive. The UK economy won't be the fastest growing economy in the world in 2024, but it won't be the laggard that all the, you know, that most people feared it would become sometime over the last three or four years. Mark Carney, this time last year, referred to the UK economy as being similar to that of Argentina, you know, and, and he wasn't laughed off the stage. Yeah. But today, that given what's happened in Argentina and where the UK is, it is frankly laughable. 
So I think it's all around expectation. And I think for, we talked about the politics of it. I think it's benign. We don't have extreme left or right contenders in our political transition that's almost certainly going to take place this year. So relative to nearly every other country in the world, particularly the US and in Europe, that looks pretty benign. Sterling has recovered. Our bond yields, our interest rates have been high, but they're falling. You know, the housing market hasn't collapsed. The consumer is relatively resilient. Employment conditions are good. We're attracting high levels of migration into the UK, which I would argue is a good thing from an economic perspective. And you can argue the toss around you know, whether it's legal migration or illegal migration. People want to come to the UK to work and pay taxes and live in our economy. So yeah, I, yeah I'm rambling on here, but I think it's, I think this 2024 could be the year that the UK just floats to the surface. And we could have a year when things change in other markets, other economies. The UK just sort of keeps going and the market's up, I don't know, 20, 30 percent. And people go, oh, yeah, OK, well, that was always going to happen at some stage, you know, and it's happened this year. It, it might not. You know, it might be it might take several years. But I think we're in that sort of that. that's how I see the UK yeah, one other thing, I mean, in terms of that is, you know, is investment flows and this sort of unwinding of the concentration of the market, particularly around the magnificent seven US big tech stocks. Those seven companies at 12 trillion market cap, that's six times the size of the UK stock market. Just those seven companies, six times the size. You know, any, any one of those companies on average is not far short of the value of the UK market. The unwinding, if I'm right, and that the pivot to lower rates, but more normalized structure of rates means that capital is less concentrated. The UK doesn't need to get much of that marginal incremental investment elsewhere to for it to be very meaningful in terms of the valuation of the UK market. Yeah. No, absolutely. And there's a there's a huge amount to play for. And as you say, if, if those magnificent seven can't hold on to all of the, the possible gains or potential gains of AI and other technologies, then presumably investors will be looking much more broadly. And the UK certainly looks well placed in that context. So yeah. And and by the way, I, I'm not I'm not suggesting in any of this that the magnificent seven are going to collapse. I mean, it doesn't need that. It's just the, where the marginal investment's going to go. It's not going to be into those stocks, would be my guess. So yeah, I think the UK is in a good place, but I've been saying that for a while. What is it they say about a, a stopped clock? You're, you're, you're right, <laughs> right, at least you're right twice a day. Yeah, well, hopefully it's right this time. And <laughs> um, yeah, no, certainly there's those positive outcomes are, I think, increasingly plausible and it's a, a great way to end. So thanks very much indeed for that yeah. and look forward to, to updating as we go through the course of the year. Okay, good to chat. Brought to you by Progressive Equity. 